morning. Glorify thy name in all the earth. Let us do that as we worship the Lord this morning. Would you stand and join us on our call to worship as we sing our doxology. Praise God from the day and all the days you've given us, Lord. We thank you for this church, Lord, and we thank you for your spirit. We pray, God, you touch each and every one of us in here today, Lord, and we pray, God, you give us a spirit of revival and thankfulness for your spirit, Lord. We pray, God, you touch each and every one of our family members who aren't able to make it to church today, Lord, and we just pray you would uh, touch them especially this morning, Lord, and let them know that we're praying about them and thinking about them and that you're also there with them, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. I want to take this opportunity to welcome you to Harrisville Baptist Church this morning. If you're visiting with us, we want to thank you for choosing to be here and worshiping with us this morning. Uh, at this time, we'd like to ask all of our congregation to stand along with our visitors and take just a moment to greet those around you who may be visiting with us this morning.
hymn, hymn number four. If you would stand as we sing all three verses. <laughs>
Good morning. How's everybody doing? I believe you. I really do. You look good. You look good this morning. I'll tell you what, it's a, uh, I, we had a great time yesterday getting to go and hang out with our children. Our children are some pretty incredible bowlers. Either that or I'm just really bad and they all beat me. I'm not real sure how that worked. Uh, we bowled, we skated, and then we did my Olympic style sport and that's eating. Uh, and uh, I whipped them all at eating, I'm pretty sure. But uh, skating and bowling, I, I was I was well behind there. So I uh, had a great time. Appreciate all the folks who, who work so hard with our children, with our youth, with all the different ministries. Uh, if you hadn't had a chance, uh, maybe you weren't able to be here last Sunday night to, uh, to to see the kids and put on the musical. That was just kind of the, the event yesterday was a celebration of, uh, of their hard work and the ones that have been in the musical there. Uh, there are some DVDs uh, that you can get your hands on if you'd like to watch the children's musical from last week and you weren't able to be here. Or you'd like to watch it again. Uh, let us know in the office. We'll get you a DVD of that. Uh, we're excited to, uh, to to have just a great, great set of things going on for all of our, our people of all ages. So uh, we want you to be able to be a part of that as well. So uh, I'll tell you, you know, uh, I, I jumped on the scale this weekend, and uh, Harris has been real good to us these last two months. Can I just tell you that just a second? I mean, I'm real good, like, like like maybe a little bit too good, or maybe I've been a little bit too good in it. And, uh, and so we, uh, we've had, we're having a great time. We got to see some friends that we hadn't seen in a few years last night celebrating a birthday party. And they said, well, how are things going? And I said, man, they're going really, really well. I mean, they're going better than I could ever expect and certainly way better than I deserve. So thank you, church, for, for letting that happen and for making that happen in so many ways. And uh, we, uh, you know, all of us in, in our lives at one point or another, we deal with, as, as we were talking about this month in this series, the idea of waiting on things and waiting on things to come. And uh, we talked about that last week that God has God-sized plans for us and that uh, things that only he can do and we don't need to jump up in there and try to uh, you know help him out he doesn't need our help he doesn't need my help he doesn't need anybody's help he's got that on his own uh, today we're going to talk about those ideas that we have those times that we spend in our life where we're waiting to be significant where we're waiting to maybe be relevant where we're waiting to be great and uh, I don't know sometimes I, I find a lot of you know my inspiration for things in media whether it be songs or, or videos or movies or TV shows, things like that. So I'm going to see if we can connect this morning. Can we connect a little bit? Uh, we've got to cut one for each age group, you know, children, youth, and then adults. Uh, so one for each. But I'm going to show you this first clip real quick. It's a quick one, about 30 seconds, about a young cub who was waiting uh, to be great, and he just couldn't wait. So, John, let's play this first one real quick. Be a mighty king, so enemies beware. Well, I've never seen a king or beast with quite so little hair. I'm gonna be the main event, like no king was before. I'm brushing up, I'm looking down, I'm working on my oh, God! Thus far, a rather an inspiring thing. Oh, I just can't wait to be king. All right, I saw a few heads bobbing out there, so we're, we're awake. That's good, that's good. That's a good start to the sermon. Uh, all right, so of course that's from the Lion King. That's from the real Lion King, not the one that's floating around in theaters right now. Uh, but the, and, and that little lion cub, his dad was king of all that he could see. You know, every looking out on the horizon, and all Simba could wait to do was to be king. And it wasn't going to be long. And boy, it drove Zazu, the little bird that was his, uh, you know, that Simba was his ward. It drove him crazy. And, uh, and and if you listen to the rest of the song, watch the rest of that part of that movie, you see how crazy it drives him. But now, I don't want the adults to feel left out in here. And I know that some of you, as I look around, some of you, we've listened to this song not too long ago on a van ride somewhere. So, uh, so I really expect the adults to sing along with this too. So let's take a look at another cer uh, certain individual that was waiting to be great, waiting to be significant. Bobby played his guitar on the hard side of town Where it's hard for a poor boy to find the money He had dedication He had the heart and soul Somehow knew he was born to play People said get a real job Support your family there's no future in the road you're taking He never said a word The dreamer just kept on Late at night you could hear him sing
I'm looking out. I got a couple of pews that are real happy with me right now. I got a few that aren't sure. I promise you I spent significant time this week looking for like a Gaither song or some old gospel tune that talked about being great sometime. But what we found out was they were already great. They weren't waiting to be great. So, so it's all these other folks, you know, the younger groups, we're trying to be great sometimes. But I think probably you can identify with me. Maybe it was when you were a kid and everybody looked at you and said, Get out of here. Do, go, go do something. Find a place. You know, find, find some job. Get busy or something like that. Maybe it was when you were first at your job as a young adult, um, and uh, and the people who were you know the 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 real workers wouldn't let you do anything. Uh, maybe it's something you know in another time of your of your life where you know that you've been built, you know that you've been created, you know that you've even been saved for something amazing, but but you're just waiting for it to happen. You're just waiting to see. Well, when is it going to get better than this? When am I going to be more effective at what the, you know, whatever it is that God has me doing? Hopefully we think about it in the context of what God has us doing, but we certainly, I think, all of us at some point or another have thought about it in the context of just the things we find ourselves doing each and every day. Well, uh, buckle up. We're going to cover quite a bit of, of history and scripture this morning uh, from uh, about 30, verse, chapter 37 to about chapter 50. You ready? About 14 verses? Don't worry, we're going to skip around a lot. But if you would stand with me, uh, we are going to skip around, starting with chapter 37, verse 5. We'll end up in verse 50. But you can follow along in your bulletin uh, or on our screens or, of course, in your copy of the Word as we read from God's Word this morning. In Genesis chapter 37, looking at the story of Joseph. In chapter 37, verse 5, we read, Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. We skip to verse 28. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. We skip to chapter 39, verse 2. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. Skipping down to verse 20, same chapter. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. Moving to verse, or chapter 41, verse 39. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. And in chapter 50, verse 18. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him, we are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, Don't be afraid. I, am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Would you have a seat? Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you, Father, that through this, uh, just the highlights of the story of Joseph this morning, we can see what it means, an example of of someone who has faith in you and stays true to you, what it means to wait for a significant amount of time to become significant. Lord God, would you help us this morning to, uh, to look into our own lives. God, as you look into our hearts and our motives and, and, and the things that make us tick. God, as we look together at who we are and why we are the way we are and why we do the things we do, God, would you work in our lives? Would you work in our hearts this morning? And God, if you find motives and we are shown by you motives and motivations in our life that aren't of you, God, would you take this morning to change our hearts? God, if there's some, some of us in here who have not yet given our life to you by putting our faith in Jesus Christ, would today be the day, Lord, we beg of you, that you would save some right here in, this, in our midst. Lord God, in all of this, would you teach us, God, how to wait and how to wait rightly on you and in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, Joseph is a character many of you know well. If you've been in church a little while, he gets talked about quite a bit. And uh, Joseph was the consummate little bratty brother. 
You say, well, wait a minute now. He's kind of a, an important person in Scripture. Well, there were a lot of important people in Scripture who were not always the most fun people to be around. Uh, think about that for just a second. Can you imagine having Paul over to your Super Bowl party? Um, that would not exactly... He, he'd be sitting there uh, by the second snap going, what are we waiting for, guys? Why are we sitting around watching this big you know, thing happening on the, on the screen? Let's go talk to people about Jesus, right? Uh, and you'd say, well, hey, we're going to do that at halftime. You're like, halftime? What is that? You know, you know, not all the Bible characters that we hold in such reverence uh, were worthy of reverence until God chose to use them. And, and Joseph is one of those. Joseph, of course, you know, is, is one of the sons of Jacob. He is the favorite son of Jacob uh, out, of the, out of the sons that would, would be the beginnings of the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, Jacob is the one that they all hated because his father loved him so much. Joseph is the one who gets the coat of many colors. And uh, who, that's just one example of him always getting the best, even though he was not the one that produced the best. In fact, in that Travis Tritt song we listened to a second ago, it talks about the dreamer just keeps on. Joseph was the dreamer. Joseph was the one who, while his brothers were all working hard, uh, doing whatever it is they were doing for their father's household, Joseph was kind of sitting there. You know, he was just, he was looking up in the sky, maybe had his eyes closed. Um, he was all the things that Wayne Harris accuses me of being, right? He, he, he was a dreamer, you know, and God uses those. No, I won't go there. That's not the message this morning, but but seriously, he was a dreamer, he, and he was despised by his brothers. Well, you know, it's one thing to be the dreamer and to have dreams of being superior to those who are, uh, at least in, in, in practicality, maybe a little bit more superior to you. But Joseph did this great idea. He had this great idea. He decided, you know what I'll do is I'll tell my brothers about these dreams where I'm so much better than them. Now, anybody have any little brothers in here? Okay, see a few hands going up, all right. If they're sitting next to you, don't point at them, don't, don't, don't shove them off the pew or anything like that. Uh, but how good of an idea is it for your little brother to tell you about his dream where he was so much better than you, so much better than you, that not only did unreal things happen, but you bowed down to him in that dream. But some of you guys are getting mad right now that have little brothers, and like they're not, they're not even in the room, they may not be in the zip code. Uh, but that's exactly what Joseph did. Joseph, in, in the first part of the, of the story that we read today, uh, Joseph has this dream, and he decides, hey, guys, I need to tell you about this. you know. And you can just see him beaming, talking about it. He says, hey, look, we were all around, and, uh, and we were working, and, uh, and, and, and my sheath, it, it, it stood up. Well, so first off, he says something totally unrealistic, right? It doesn't matter what you're farming. If in the middle of, uh, of, of dealing with it, in the middle of, of you know, reaping that harvest, your plant does something that plants don't do, it's, it's a little out of the ordinary, right? I mean, you know, you know if, you're, if you're threshing wheat, you know, the wheat in the middle of it doesn't just jump up and do a little dance, you know? Uh, it, it just doesn't work that way. So first off, he's, his dream is something crazy. His dream is something that they're like, okay, really? Come on. You know, I, do, do you really think that can happen? And then, before he can, they can even ask that question out loud to him, he says, oh, and by the way, while my sheep was dancing, all of yours bowed down to it because I'm greater than you are, <laughs> Right? This is how Joseph is sharing his dreams. And so what we find out about Joseph is, is that he, he believes he's great. At the very least, he believes that he one day will be great. Now, we, you know, theologians debate all the time whether these dreams were actually dreams from God or whether they were dreams from Joseph. You know, a lot of times I think we automatically interpret them as dreams from God because we, we find out the way that the rest of the story goes, as we'll see today. But, you know, there's some debate about whether or not this was just who Joseph was. That this was possibly just that he was this little dreamer who was just, he just knew some way, somehow, he was going to be that somebody. And, and that he was going to be significant somehow. And he didn't always know best how to explain it to those around him. And then when you match that with his father's favoritism of him, uh, it really just, I mean, chapped the hides of, uh, of his brothers. And, and probably rightfully so, right? Because they're doing all the work. He's getting all the credit. And then he's bragging about things and talking about how great he's going to be and how they will eventually bow down. Well, this kind of gives us our first point this morning that, that you know, our waiting for significance doesn't always go well. Now, you may not be the braggart, you may not be the dreamer like Joseph, but you can probably relate to this, I would think, this morning. If you've ever waited on your time or your season or your future of being significant in this world, you know that sometimes there's some ups and there's some downs of it. Sometimes we think we're there, and we think, this is what I've been waiting for, and then we realize, no, nope, that wasn't it at all. 
Sometimes we do get into exactly where God has planned to make us significant. And then we, in our own, you know, our own actions, our own attitudes, our own reactions to what he's doing, we let it go to our head. And we become um, contrary to what God's character is for people who he makes to be great, who he makes to be significant. Our waiting on significance doesn't always go well. And that's okay because in it we have to constantly remember to be with God. And that's the thing that we see for the bulk of Joseph's story is that even though he doesn't know whether, whether they were dreams from God that he just didn't share very well or whether they were his own dreams that made him share them even worse, either way, he knew that something was in his future. He believed it with all his heart, but he didn't have great circumstances outside of it, the way his father treated him. And so here's this, here's this young man just waiting to be great. Here's this young man just waiting for finally his big moment. Now, we don't know if he was waiting because he wanted to glorify God or just because he wanted to have his 15 minutes of fame. We, we really don't get a lot of that until we start to read further on into the story. Of course, you know the story. You know that, that Joseph says these things about his dreams, and his brothers are like, well, you know what we should do as good older brothers? We should just kill him. And that was their plan. They, they, they had it figured out. They were going to go out, have him in the field. They were going to kill him. They were going to slaughter him. And they were going to act like and, and make up a story to tell their father, uh, you know, to bring his, his garment back with this blood of, you know, so, you know of, of a dog and said that some animal had torn him up. Right, that some somebody else had attacked him. They didn't know that they were perfectly innocent in the whole deal, but their plan was to kill him. And thankfully, God, in the way that He was working out Joseph's life and story and prolonging it at this point, uh, He gave Reuben, one of his older brothers, uh, a little bit of voice of reason in this moment. He says, "Look, guys, we're not going to accomplish anything. It's only going to make matters worse if we kill him." Now, at this point, Reuben starts to seem like the hero. Until you find out that Reuben's voice of reason says, hey, you know what, let's not kill him. That'd be wrong. Let's sell him instead. Well, I don't know which one's better at this point, to, to, you know, to kill or to sell a person. I, wouldn't, I would advise not to do either, okay? That's probably not a good idea for us today in any way, shape, or form. No killing, no selling. If you don't get anything out of the message uh, except for that, I'll feel like we had a successful morning here, okay? Uh, but, but here Reuben says, let's just sell him. It'll get him out of our hair. Then we can still act like, you know, we found him dead and it wasn't our fault. So I don't know if Reuben was the big hero here, but God certainly used him to at least extend Joseph's life to see the rest of what would uh, unfold for him. And so they do. They sell him to these traveling uh, merchants, and, and they sell him for 20 shekels of silver. Well, it's an interesting thing when you look at Joseph's story throughout and compare it to Jesus' story throughout. We also know that Jesus was later sold for 30 shekels of silver, right? For, for you know... Why the difference? Well, inflation, I guess, in biblical times. I don't, I don't really know, to be honest with you. Uh, well, you could look at it, you could go really spiritual and say, well, Jesus is worth more than Joseph. That would work too, right? But either way, there's this, there's this despising by those who should love him, being sold, and then later on being used to, to literally save, for us, for Jesus, our spiritual lives, not just our physical lives. So Joseph's brother's selling, and, uh, and as we read a moment ago, they, uh, the, the, the merchants take him down to Egypt. Well, they sell him to a man. He finds himself in a man's house named Potiphar. And Potiphar is a, is a pretty important guy. He's not the most important guy in Egypt, but he's pretty important in the government, uh, in the military there. And so uh, Joseph remains with God. In other words, his faith stays where God expects it to be. And so God brings him prosperity. Now, remember, in the Old Testament, these two were always linked. In the Old Testament, the way that they had a, an understanding with God was, was that, you know, if your faith stayed where you, you, it was supposed to be in God and you did what you were supposed to, they would expect good things to happen, prosperity to happen. Uh, and they would expect great crop yields. They would expect great families and lots of children. They would expect monetary gains, livestock gains, land gains, all these things. And that was reasonable because God, that was how God worked. Now, we know, of course, that this side of the cross, this side of uh, you know, into the, living in the New Testament church age, we, we know that our greatest thing that we can expect of God when our faith is where it's supposed to be, which is in Christ, is Christ. We don't need all that other stuff. And it's not that they needed it back then, but it was God working out his plan so that we now could even look back and say, we don't need a kingdom full of riches. We have the king living within ourselves. 
And, uh, and so again, we have this comparison back and forth between Joseph and Jesus. Well, in Potiphar's house, Joseph becomes so prosperous that Potiphar, as we read there in that second, uh, second set of uh, verses, uh, Potiphar puts him in charge of everything in his house. And, and that meant everything, right? There was nothing that Potiphar worried about um, when, uh, when, he was, you know, when, when he had Joseph in his household. Joseph took care of everything, and he was faithful in it, and God brought that prosperity with it. Uh, chapter 39, verse 2 that we read said, The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. Well, what happens is, between verse 2 of chapter 39 and verse 20 of chapter nine, or of 39, we find out that this, this drama has unfolded. This soap opera has happened. Potiphar's wife has decided that she likes Joseph a little bit too. So much so that she just wants to have an improper relationship with him. We'll leave it at that this morning. Joseph, though, stays righteous. Joseph denies that. First and foremost, we believe, because of his faith in God and the fact that he's seeing God work in his life, bringing him into significance. Whether he's still waiting on greater significance or whether he believes that this is the significance he's been waiting on, we're not real sure. But we know he stays faithful. And so when Potiphar's wife makes advances towards him, he denies it. He, he says no. He says, look, I would never do that to my master, Potiphar, who, is tr who is, has treated me so well, who has trusted me the way he has. I'll never break his trust that way. Now, spiritually speaking, he was also saying, I'll never do that to my God, who has prospered me in this way. I will never break this confidence. I'll never break this, this, this trust that I've been given by this earthly master, and I'll never break the expectations as best I can of my heavenly master. And so here's Joseph. He says no, and just like his brother's, Potiphar's wife schemes against him. Just like his brothers, Potiphar's wife's like, okay, he's not doing what I want him to do, so we're going to get rid of him. And so what she decides to do one day when she makes an advance and he literally runs out of his cloak to get away from her, she holds on to the cloak and makes up this story that says that he made an advance toward her. And of course, then we read verse 20, where it says, Joseph's master took him, put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. Potiphar came back, heard the story, and of course took his wife's word for it. And then Joseph was in trouble again. He wasn't back in a cistern out in the middle of the wilderness. Now he was in the Egyptian royal prison. And so he spends a great deal of time there. Uh, but the second part of verse 20 says, But while Joseph was there in prison, and then coming on to verse 21, The Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. Which helps us to remember our second point this morning, and that's that, that as long as God is in it, it will happen one step at a time. For Joseph, I don't know that it felt that way. I don't know that he was like, hey, you know what, this is okay, this is just another step in the process that God's using to make me who he wants me to be. We do know that he remained faithful to God. We do know that he continued to trust in God. And we know that, that as we see the story continue to unfold, we see that God continues to raise him up. He's been... Uh, he's been the, the favorite amongst his family. People attacked him. He's now been the favorite in a household far away from his family, in the place where he's now a, a servant, and people attacked him. Well, now he's in prison in Egypt with the royal prisoners, the ones who have really done big things that offended you know, the king, that offended Pharaoh. And yet God continues to prosper. He's still waiting. And we can remember... We can remember as we are waiting for our moment or moments or future of significance, whatever it is we believe that God has for us in the future, we can remember and have great confidence and take great comfort in the fact that step by step, according to God's timing, if we're waiting on him to make us great, not just trying to make ourselves great, if we're truly waiting on the Lord, then step by step, as only God can know and as only God can do, he's going to work. In our lives. He will bring it to pass. He'll let it happen the way that he has designed it to happen. You say, well, Rich, that, that sometimes takes a lot longer than I want it to. Well, sometimes it does, right? And many of us have not found ourselves as a slave. Many of us have not been sold to someone else. Many of us have not found ourselves in prison. Um, and yet, this is the example that God gives us in the, in the story of Joseph to remind us that as we were waiting on God to do that God-sized thing or those God-sized things in our life that he has purposed us for from before we even knew ourselves much less anybody else as we're waiting on that he's working one step at a time 
I, I could take a long time, and I won't this morning because we've still got a lot of ground to cover in, in the Scripture. Uh, but I could tell you lots of stories over the last 25 years or so, or really a little bit longer than that, uh, from the time God first started to weigh on my heart about serving in ministry uh, as, as a career, as a vocation, as the way I would you know, feed my family even before I had a family. Um, I could tell you just step by step how one thing happened and the next thing happened and I can look back and I don't know, I don't claim to be greatness or, or significant at this point, but any significance I had, God has been working it in this process. And, and, and at the time, I was like a lot of you in your wait and in your waiting, I was like, well, this isn't it, you know? I was dissatisfied in, those, in some of those moments. But yet as I look back, I start to see how they built on one another. And I know that God was, was at work and continues to be at work in everything that happens. And in fact, that everything that happens right and wrong, he's allowing to happen, and he's using it to build me and to shape me. As James and several other New Testament authors would put it, as we, are, as we go through trials, it is to build our faith in God. And as our, as our faith is built in God, well, guess what? We start to become more who he wants us to be. And the greatness that he has in his kingdom for us to fulfill comes from him step by step. And as long as he's in it, it'll happen one step at a time. One thing we can look at is when it's not happening, and maybe it's not happening for a prolonged period of time, doesn't mean that we may not have some more waiting to do. But one thing we can always be doing is checking ourselves. Is my motivation here waiting on God to make me great for his purpose? Or am I trying to find greatness for my own purpose, for my own vanity, for my own pride, for my own ego, for my own comparison with these other people around that, I, that I've you know, looked at as a standard in my life or that I'm looking at currently as a standard? You know, they say that comparison is the thief of joy or the robber of joy. And, and when we look at one another, when we look at a, another person and use them as a standard in our life, we will never, ever be able to have full joy because, one, they're the wrong standard. Christ is our standard. And he's our only standard. And the only thing that we need to recognize that's good in a person's life is the things that look like Christ if we ourselves are in Christ. Until then, we're chasing the wind, as Ecclesiastes puts it. We're, we're, just, we're chasing after something that we'll never catch. And even if we do catch it, it'll get right away from us. But when we're looking for God to make us great for him, then we start to see uh, how these things start to fit together. And we start to be able to have a little bit more patience. We start to be able to wait better um lastly this morning as we look down we, we get down to the end of joseph's story uh while he's in prison uh the cupbearer and the baker from the from from the king there uh come and they've also been put in prison uh but but joseph hears about some dreams that, that the king pharaoh has had and uh and he interprets them right and and this gets him out of prison and eventually gets him up to being much like he was in potiphar's house second only to Potiphar. Well, now, as we read, Pharaoh says to him, look, the only way you've known these things is because God has given you this wisdom. There's nobody wiser than you. And so you are going to be second in command of all of Egypt. That's a major position. You talk about some greatness in the world, some ability to affect people. Some of us the Brotherhood this morning were talking about you know, politicians sometimes, you know, they, they, they make a lot of promises that they can't always, you know, cash in on. Maybe they want to. Maybe it's, they make those promises genuinely and find out that they just can't get it done. And sometimes they just do the, you know, the campaign speech type of, of promise. But either way, you know, to, to get to some of these levels, I mean, vice president of the United States is a pretty powerful position, you know. You know, it's not the old Ricky Bobby thing where if you ain't first, you're last. I mean, vice president's pretty good, guys. I mean, that's a pretty good way to go, you know. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, second in, in command only to the president. Well, here is Joseph in Egypt, powerful nation that it was during this time. And he's second only to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh says, only with relationship to the throne, only with regard to the fact that I'm Pharaoh, will, will I be greater than you. So we can't underestimate, we can't understate the importance, the significance that Joseph eventually rises to. And then we find out, the purpose. We find out the reason why. We find out that God has been working this all the way through for a very intentional and very specific purpose. We read there, it says, his brothers then came, and this is verse uh, 18 in chapter 50, his brothers then came and threw themselves before him. Well, what's the setting here? Well, back in Israel, back in, in, in Canaan, 
back where his brothers had sold him and then gone on with their lives and dealt with their father's uh, grief and grieving process as he went through losing his favorite son, there became a famine. It was part of what Joseph had, had interpreted uh, for Egypt and, and uh, because of his interpretation that God allowed him to do in Egypt as he rose to be second in command, Egypt became the only place in the region that had food. And so his brothers, starving in one last-ditch effort, not a small effort, mind you, but literally getting together as much as they could, going to a foreign kingdom to beg for enough food to take home to literally save their family and their people, they come down and guess who they find an audience with? Joseph. At first, they don't recognize him, but Joseph recognizes his brothers almost right away. And it's not until Joseph tells them who he is that they realize, and that's where we pick up in verse 18 here, that they throw themselves to the ground. They bow down before him. Sound familiar? They bow down before him and they say, verse 18, we are your slaves. The very thing that angered them to the point that they would even want to kill him came to pass. And it even came to pass, you know, they talk about they're, they're threshing the sheaves there and, and they're working with the crops. Well, it's over crops. You see, none of them had any idea that that either dream that Joseph just had or the dream that God gave him, either way, none of them had any idea the significance of that that would take place uh, 15, 20 years later. They had no idea. Joseph didn't even have an, uh, an understanding of how it was going to work, but there they are. Standing at his, at, his, you know, at his feet, in front of him, in the throne of the place that is their only hope for salvation. And they're bowing down to him, just like that dream had said. Now Joseph, at this point, has a very unique position, doesn't he? He's got an opportunity here. He's got a couple opportunities. He can go a couple different ways with this. Uh, he can do what many of us might would have been thinking about from the time our brothers, you know, our brothers put us in that cistern and, and we're, you know, we could hear them making the plan to to kill us or sell us or whatever they were going to do, he could have just said, well, this is my time for revenge. He could, have, he could have assumed that, you know what? God's brought me to a point of power so I can be vindicated so that all this stuff that my brothers have done wrong to me and all the ways they've abused me and in the way that they disregarded my life as if I wasn't even a person. He could, he could have said, hey, we, we don't have any for you guys. Go on. Or... He didn't have to say that. He could have just snapped his fingers and the guards could have come and killed him right there. Or if you're a little bit more poetic, he could have had the guards come and sell them into slavery. He had an opportunity for any type of vengeance he wanted to take. He had the power. He had the situation set up. I mean, it was on a tee right there for him. And he could swing away. But thankfully, as part of Joseph's character, and as the thing that we see makes him truly great in the kingdom of God, is he welcomes his brothers. He is already forgiven, chosen to forgive, and now has, it's, that forgiveness is also there on the tee, ready for him to swing away in forgiveness instead of vengeance. It says, but Joseph said to them, in verse 19, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? In other words, am I the one who's supposed to punish your sin? Verse 20, it's very famous and, and very well taught and quoted out of this story of Joseph. Chapter 50, verse 20 says, You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. You see, any significance that God will bring to our lives, any significance that is worth us waiting for in the Lord, our significance is always going to be tied to his purpose. There will never be a time where God makes you or me or us as a collective group great just simply for us. It will always be a part of his purpose. Well, what is his purpose above all? It's to draw people to salvation through Jesus Christ. And so for us, for you Christians this morning, if we're waiting for greatness... One of the things that we can tell about how long it's taking and whether it's going in the right direction and things like that is, is are we looking for greatness in God's purpose? 
Or are we looking to just simply be great so that we can rub other people's nose in it? Or so that we can just enjoy ourselves or not have to work as hard or not have to do as much or, or, or feel like we've, you know, we've, we've arrived in our lives. It always, the, the significance that we wait on in the Lord will always be tied to His purpose. It will always be able to be used and be designed to be used to love others to the point that they would see the love of Christ in us the forgiveness of Christ in us, the purpose of Christ in us, so that they might come to salvation. So Harrisville, what we're talking about this morning is this, is that wherever you are in your wait for significance, maybe, maybe you feel that your most significant time is in your rearview mirror. Maybe you feel like you're, you're kind of going the negative <laughs> side of waiting for significance. Maybe you're feeling that you're no longer significant. You used to do a lot of things for God, but because of time, because maybe of age or because of health or, 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 or mental status or whatever else or just, you know, situation in life that you're in that you, you can't be that anymore. Well, no, you absolutely can. And if he made you great at one point, he wants to use that greatness to remind you of what he can do in your life even now and going forward. And, and that significance that he brought you, it's not just for a season and gone. It's to train us. Now, we may not have a bunch of people listening to us like we might have at one point. But we've got some. We might not have the widespread influence that we used to have when we maybe owned a major company. But we've got some influence. Every one of us in the room, we've got influence. And hey, if you don't think you do, we've got plenty of positions of service that we can put you in. And we will, we will expand your, your situation of influence if you need it. But God has, even if your moments of your greatest time you feel is behind you, he still has greatness and significance in his kingdom for you to, to await. Or maybe you're sitting there this morning and you're like, well, you know, Brother Rich, I, I just, I don't feel like I've ever been really all that important. I don't really think that anybody cares what I do because either I've messed it up for so long that they don't think that I can do right. They don't think that I'll ever change. Or maybe, you know, I've just been okay, just kind of been under the radar, and so they're okay with that, and that's all we need. Well, wherever you are, if you don't think that those moments and that future of significance has come to you yet and you're still waiting, be encouraged. And stay faithful to God more and more until you understand that significance and, and until it comes to pass, because it will come to pass if he's in it. And for any of us, whether we're, maybe we're in right now the most significant moments of our life, like we don't feel like at, at any point we will ever make a bigger contribution than we're making now, make sure, if that's how you are right now, make sure that that contribution you're making is a positive one towards God's kingdom. Especially if today you call yourself a Christian. Because if it's only about making money, if it's only about banking cash, if it's only about accumulating property uh, or having toys and, and, and stuff to play with and places to go and people to see, if it's only about that, well, the reward we get for that happens right now. And then it's over. And as many of us can attest to, all those toys can come quick and go away quicker. In a moment, we can find out that even though we've got a bunch of stuff, a bunch of money, a bunch of, of pull, or, or a bunch of clout, one moment can change everything, and none of that will matter. But what is of eternal significance, that significance that comes from God and God alone, that greatness that he brings us to for his glory and for his purpose, that will always, eternally, be important. It will always be something, if it's in the past, to praise him for and to try to get back to and try to relate back to. If it's in the future, it'll always be something worth praising him for as we wait and thanking him in advance before it even comes here. So Harrisville Baptist Church this morning, if you're here and, and, and you're in some way looking at, at your level of significance in the world, whether you're underestimating it, overestimating, or just estimating it right now, I would encourage you to look to the Lord. Joseph looked to the Lord. He didn't have anything else. And one thing we know about Joseph, to be sure, is that he looked to the Lord and God looked right back to him and carried him step by step through the process and then used him to save God's people. Now, we don't need God to use us to save others, but God chooses to use us to bring others to the one who does. And so for us as a church, for you as an individual, how significant are you in your witness? How great are you in your faith? How important are you in the way 
that you have chosen to pattern your life after what God has commanded and after what he has expected. I look out over a great crowd of people this morning. It's so good to see each and every one of you. And I believe with all of my heart that God has significance and greatness for every single one of you in his plan and his eyes. And the only reason I believe that is because, I mean, I didn't come out of the womb as a minister, right? I mean, at 16 years old, he called me, and I just happened to be in the right place at the right time where I didn't mess that part of it up. Messed up a lot of the other parts of it along the way. But then I think back to opportunities that he's given me and give him all the glory for it to be a part of seeing people come to Christ, of seeing people's lives change, of seeing ministry happen that I could have never even conceptualized on my own, much less made happen. I know that God has significance for you because any significance that I've had has come from him. And if he can do it in my life, I know he can do it in your life because some of you guys are starting off way further down the road than I will. And so don't be discouraged if you're waiting for that. Continue to wait. Wait faithfully. Wait obediently. Understand that it is still to come. There is still more out there. Don't give up. Don't give in to the momentary, well, Potiphar's wife's making an advance. I guess this could be okay for right now. Nothing else seems to be happening. I'm not going anywhere else. I'll just at least be happy in this area. Don't fall for that trap. Wait obediently. Wait well. Think about what Joseph went through. This morning, maybe you're waiting to give your life to Christ. Maybe you came in here this morning and you've, you've heard it, you know. You've heard the gospel. You've heard about that we are all on our own sinners. That if it was left to just us, we are hopeless to save ourselves. And you've also heard the good news of the gospel that because we are hopeless on our own, Christ came. He came and he lived as a, as a human. He put on flesh and lived uh, to adulthood, and then died purposefully and intentionally on the cross to pay the debt that we couldn't pay on our own. And so maybe this morning you're hearing that and, and, and it's setting in to the point where you say, you know what, it's time, it's time to get there. It's time that I finally stop running. It's time that I decide today's the day. Well, friend, if that's today for you, I hope that you'll come down and talk to us about it. You won't come down to find salvation in your preacher. You won't come to find salvation at a, at a set of steps or a table or a cross podium. But it's a symbol and it's a step, it's a physical step so that in your mind and in your remembrance you can tie it to the moment that God saved you and you immediately were obedient in action. Or maybe God's already done that in your life this week and you just want to make it public. Either way, if you've not given your life to Christ and let people know about it, today you can do it as we sing our invitation in just a moment. But i got to believe, for a lot of us, we've given our lives to Christ. We, we truly are saved. We truly are forgiven. We truly are heaven-bound. We're destined for eternity with God. But we get real confused sometimes because it feels like we're, you know, the things we're doing are just spinning our wheels here on this earth. Maybe this morning you'd come for encouragement. Maybe you'd just sit right where you are, do some business with God in your pew, Maybe you'd pull somebody next to you or across the aisle or whoever you need. Maybe you'd go talk to them and say, hey, brother, sister, just pray with me. Just, just pray with me. I, I know there's more to my faith than what I'm seeing. And maybe you'd just come back to him and let him make your faith what he designed it to be. Maybe there's something else on your heart. This altar is open for you to come pray. I'm here to help you if, if there's any way that I can. You've got church members who love you very much in this church family who would love to pray with you and love to celebrate the decision you're making. As our musicians come forward, as we get ready to pray, would you come as God has called? Let's pray together. Lord God, we know, Father, that you're in control. And God, we thank you so much, Lord, that you, you are working in us because of your love for us. God, I thank you, Lord, that you allow us time to wait on what you're going to do in us, on us, and through us, so that we can remember and so that we can know up front that what you do in us that is significant comes from you, not from us. So God, if there's one or more who need to give their life to Jesus in saving faith this morning, would you let them come? God, if there's, there's folks out there who just feel insignificant and don't know if you're really doing anything with them, God, would you bring them for encouragement and help them to, to start a new season of waiting well on you? God, whatever the burdens of our hearts are this morning, 
Lord God, would you work and let us respond to you and you alone. And we do all this, Father, as a continuation of our worship to you and our worship of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you come?